Yeah, we celebrate that. Something cool that also happened later that day, there, there's a cancer center right across the street, so we invited that staff to come over too. We wanted to feed them also, so their doctors and nurses came over also. And later that day, we had two different people reach out to us and said, hey, uh, I was at the cancer center getting chemo, uh, and all of the nurses and doctors were talking about LifeBridge and how much what LifeBridge did meant to them and how encouraged they were. And uh, since I go to LifeBridge, I took it upon myself to have a conversation with them. And I said, hey, I go to LifeBridge, that's my church. And they started engaging with that staff. Like, that's cool. Like little stories like that, we have no idea how far that they'll go. And that's what we get to do as a church. When I was talking to Tina, the, the CEO of the hospital, she said that their staff is just over COVID. They're, they're just emotionally and mentally done with it. And we all can relate to that at some level, can't we? Like we're just, we're just over this. But here's what's going on. There's not one, there's two battles that are actually happening because of COVID. One is against the virus itself, which we all are very aware of. The other battle is against the effects that the virus has caused. So depression, anxiety, have skyrocketed this year. Domestic abuse, substance abuse is way up. I, I was reading this week uh, a certain national hotline, a, dis a distress hotline. They've received this year so far the same number of calls this year as they have the last four years combined. Combined. The CDC said that one in every four, 25%, one in every four young adults in the United States have considered suicide this year. Because of the pandemic, like that, that's just insane. Colorado, before this happened, Colorado already had a, a very high suicide rate. I mean, it's just insane. And conversations that I'm having with first responders in our church have told me that almost every single day they go on calls for either domestic abuse or suicide. Every day, every day. The conversations that I'm having with people just they break my heart to hear, like families are hurting, marriages are suffering. People are concerned. We don't know how this is going to affect our kids long term. Like the list goes on and on and on. Social isolation, the economic strain, loss, uncertainty, anxiety, all of these things have been created by the virus also. So here's what we're going to do. As a church, we're going to fight both battles. I do not believe that we can pick one or the other. I don't think that we can say, okay, we're gonna do everything we can to fight the physical battle, forget everything that people are going through mentally and emotionally, everybody's affected by that. We're just gonna focus on physical, we can't do that. We also can't say, you know what, we're just gonna focus on the mental and emotional aspect, forget the physical aspect, we just wanna go after this, this battle. No, we've got to fight both. So we are constantly evaluating this, but here's what we're gonna do. We are going to continue to meet in in-person services on Sunday because I believe that people desperately need to physically gather with other people in a safe way. We desperately need that. <clears throat> this is just my opinion, so you can, you can disagree with that and that's okay. My opinion is we, we don't know the long-term effects of the virus. Like we don't know how bad that's going to be, but it's gonna, there's going to be long-term effects, long-term effects. I believe that we've reached the point where it's now just as dangerous not to gather. I think we've reached that point. We, we're, we're there. So we know the worst thing that we can do physically with the virus right now would be to get a few thousand people and cram them all into a very small room, nobody wearing masks, hugging each other. We know that, that that's the worst thing we could do physically right now. That would be dumb. Well, what's equally as dangerous on the mental side is isolation. Like when, when there are periods of prolonged stress and anxiety, on times of uncertainty, economic strain, loss, like what we've experienced this year, the worst thing you can do in times like that is to isolate people. Like we, the virus is very real. We wanna take that seriously physically, but we also need to take seriously what's happening to us mentally and emotionally. We're all being affected by that. One of my absolute heroes of the faith is a guy by the name of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, he said this, that the physical presence of other believers is a source of incomparable strength and joy for the believer. So Christians gathering together, physically together, is a source of strength and joy that we cannot compare. I believe that that is more true right now than it ever has been in my entire lifetime. We need each other. I need you. I need you. 
Like you need me. We all need each other right now. So here's what we're going to do. Here's how we're going to fight both battles. On the physical side, we're going to continue to support people who have been affected by the virus, like we've been doing ever since March. We're going to look for ways to encourage and support our healthcare workers and our first responders because those men and women are heroes. And if that means we need to go cater more food trucks and write more handwritten notes, that's what we're going to do. If there's other ways that we can serve and opportunities we have to support, we're going to do those things too. We're going to fight the virus physically by, by adhering to the CDC guidelines. Man, we're going to, while we're here, we're going to wear masks. We're going to distance. We're going to clean before and after services. Everyone that's come here so far since we've started services back up in the building, y'all have done a great job with that. We're going to continue to keep the numbers in this room small like they are so we can spread out. We even have other venues on our campus right now ready to go if we need to spread out even more. And we want to do that outside too. When you're around, when you're around outside, man, wear a mask when you're around other people. If you are sick or you have symptoms, just stay home. Like, don't go to the grocery store. Don't come here. If you need to go to the store, we have a massive church. Call. We'll have people go to the store for you. People would love to serve you in that way. We want to continue to fight it physically. Here's how we're going to fight it on the emotional side, on the mental side. We're going to continue to check in on people. We're going to continue to encourage people. Check in on the people that you know. Don't just assume that everything's great. You know, we do a great job wearing masks. I mean, pun intended. We do a great job make, wearing a mask saying to everyone, everything's great. Everything's great when things aren't necessarily great. Just because you think people are doing well, it might, they might not be doing well. Check in on them. Randomly encourage people in your circles of influence. Encouragement is the mental vaccine for COVID. It's the mental vaccine for COVID. Man, send somebody a text message with a specific encouragement. Send them something on social media. Call them. Write them a handwritten note. Be so overwhelmingly generous with encouragement. The other thing we're going to do to fight the mental aspect of this battle is we're going to gather in person so that people don't have to experience isolation all the time and can gather physically together. One of the things that we should be very, very grateful for in this season is technology. The fact that we can live stream and connect with each other digitally is a massive, massive gift. And we are going to continue to do online and do it well. But online does not replace what happens when we physically gather together. There's a transcendent power when other people gather together to worship and to hear the word preached that, that technology cannot capture. So if you're ready, come. Like be here. Don't deny yourself that. If you're not ready to be here yet, man, we'll still engage with you online. Engage there and that's okay. Be connected there. Continue to encourage and look for ways to be a blessing there. And when you are ready, we're ready for you here. Come. And the other thing with all of this is this. Everyone has an opinion on this. Everybody, it's surprising, right? Everybody has an opinion on this. Don't judge people that disagree with you on where you stand on this whole issue. Don't do that. Like, don't take shots at people. Don't criticize. One of the things that, that's been really obvious in 2020, our culture, we have all received a PhD in criticism. Like we're really good at criticizing anything and everything right now. Now's the time to drop the criticism and replace it with encouragement. It's time to do that. We need to take all of our emotion and our energy and focus it at the same place to fight this battle that COVID has created, both on the physical side and the mental side. And when we do that, we're going to get through this. We are going to get through this. But if you're struggling right now, don't suffer in silence. Like, don't suffer in silence. You're not alone. And one of the things that the enemy does really well is try to convince you that you're the only one. That whatever's going on with you, that whatever you're struggling with, you're the only one, so you must be really messed up. You are completely alone. That's a lie. You're not. Man, so many people, I'm hearing the same thing over and over and over again. There is nothing new that people aren't struggling with right now. You're not alone. So if you need to talk with someone, if we can pray for you, if, if there's something that we can do for you in any way, reach out, please. Don't suffer in silence. You can text the number that's on the screen right now and one of our pastors will get back to you. Or if you're here right now in the room, find a green shirt after the service. Come find me. Don't suffer in silence. And then John 14, Jesus actually says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Okay. I don't know. Maybe that sounds even a little bit off right now. 
Maybe even a little tone deaf with everything that's happening in the world. I mean, that people are angry. I don't know if you've noticed that right now. People are angry. People are anxious. People are sick of all of this. People are hurt by all of this. I mean, the list is long. There are plenty of things this year that you could be troubled by. One of our staff members affectionately refers to this year as an advent calendar. Every single day, you have no idea what you're going to find behind that little window when you open it up. I mean, that's 2020, is it not? So why would Jesus say, don't let your hearts be troubled then? Especially when you know when he said this. So the night right before Jesus was betrayed, arrested, illegally put on trial, beaten within the inch of his life, and then nailed to a wooden cross until he was dead. He knew all of that was going to happen. The night before all of that happened is when he said, don't let your hearts be troubled. That should catch our attention. He's at dinner with 12 of his closest disciples, a dinner that's referred to as the Last Supper. Maybe you've heard of that. And at this dinner, tensions were high. This was not a party. The disciples were on the verge of panicking. Jesus just told them, he said, hey guys, I'm leaving. Where I'm going, you can't come with me. And he's being really cryptic about what he's talking about and where he's going. And, and now the disciples are getting even more concerned. What, like, what do you mean, Jesus, you're leaving and we can't go with you? We've been with you by your side for three straight years and now you're leaving and we can't go with you and you won't even tell us where you're going? What's that all about? And then he tells them that one of them, he doesn't name the person specifically. One of them is about to betray him. So now they're looking around the table, whispering to each other, trying to figure out who it is, hoping that they're not the Benedict Arnold. Then Peter, in typical Peter fashion, stands up to give this grand speech. He tries to be the hero, and Jesus looks at him and says, okay, yeah, that's great. Thanks, Peter, really appreciate that. But actually, um, you're about to deny me three times before tonight's even over. And then to make all of this uneasiness go to the next level, Jesus washes all these guys' nasty feet. Like something that only the lowest servant would do. So by Jesus doing that to them, it makes them really uncomfortable. He's leaving. They don't know where he's going and they can't go with him. So it feels like they're being left out high and dry. One of them is going to betray him. Peter's going to deny him three times to save his own skin. Like these guys are anxious. This is not going the way that they planned. They had something completely different imagined. These guys left their hometowns. They left their businesses. They hooked their wagons to Jesus. And now it's going completely different than what they originally imagined. So they're troubled. They're troubled. And Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Why? He says, don't let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. There's more than enough room in my father's home. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I'll come and get you so that you'll always be with me where I am. Enough room in my father's home. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Do you know what he's talking about? Heaven. He's talking about heaven. He's talking about eternal life. He's talking about what's coming for everyone who follows Christ. He's talking about how he's going to come back and get you. Now, there are 318 references in the New Testament, 318 references to how Jesus is going to come back and how he is going to come and get you if you are his. This is not a glossed over subject. This is a focal point of the Bible that if you are a follower of Christ, you have eternal life right now. And Jesus is talking about this right before he's crucified. He's talking about this when his friends are stressed out, they're anxious. The reason why there are so many references to this in the Bible, the reason why Jesus is talking about it with his friends who are about to freak out is because the reality of heaven is medicine for a troubled heart. The reality of heaven. That's medicine that we need when it feels like the world is just burning to the ground. This goes back to the whole temporary perspective versus an eternal one like we talked about a couple weeks ago. If I have a temporary perspective, if this life is it, if this is it, then the lows of a year like this, they're borderline unbearable. But if my perspective is eternal, if it's eternal, 
then I can go through a year like this and still have peace. It doesn't mean that I won't experience pain. It doesn't mean that I won't be stressed out. That stuff's going to happen. But it means I can go through a year like 2020 and still have my hope intact. My pain is what is temporary, not my perspective. So if you are troubled, if you're suffering, if you're struggling, and all of us have been at some point this year, probably most of us are still right now. We don't have to lie about it. We can just be real and authentic and honest about it. If you're troubled, remember heaven. Remember heaven, because it's comforting to know that all this turmoil, that all this uncertainty, that all this loss and this stress and this anxiety, all of this is temporary. It's comforting to know that your final reality is heaven. It's eternal life if you trust in Jesus. He says, trust in God, trust also in me. He equates himself with God again right here because Jesus is God. He's saying, guys, I'm preparing what's coming next. I got this. You can trust me. I'm working way ahead. Everything that you're experiencing right now, it's all temporary. It's got an expiration date. What's final for you is your eternal life in paradise with me, what you were created for. You can trust me. Heaven, the reality of heaven is medicine for a troubled heart only, only if you trust Jesus. That's it. Do you trust Jesus? And I know this year has been scary. And maybe you're wondering if, if you or a loved one is going to get sick and that's unnerving. I know many of you have lost a job and you're not sure what's next for you or your family. I know many of you are just angry angry about what's happened this year, all of the different things that have happened this year. I get it. Me, me too. But if your trust is in Jesus, like he's saying, that means that whatever happens in this life is the closest that you will ever come to hell. Hell sparks fear. Heaven gives fuel. So if you trust Jesus, let heaven fuel you. Don't let what feels like hell right now, don't let that scare you. Jesus is saying when everything's going down, hey, just remember, keep looking up. The reality of heaven is medicine for a troubled heart. And then he keeps going, keeps going. And you know the way where I'm going. No, we don't, Lord, Thomas said. We have no idea where you're going, so how can we know the way? I love Thomas, man. That's just straight up. He's just being real. He's like, man, what are you talking about, Jesus? The way? I don't know where you're going. How, how could we know the way? We don't have directions at all. Can, can you help us out here, bro? We really appreciate that. The reason why this isn't computing for Thomas or the disciples, the reason why we can struggle with this too is because the disciples, and often we do, have the wrong train of thought, completely thinking about something different than what Jesus is talking about. Thomas thought that the way that Jesus is talking about, he thought that it was an actual physical road and the directions were not coming up in Google Maps for him. Or he thought it was some kind of religious checklist that he had to accomplish. Like, I gotta, I gotta do these religious things. I gotta check all these boxes, which is what he would have been taught his entire life. If I do these things, if I accomplish this stuff, if, if I'm a good person, if I live a good life, that's what you're talking about, right, Jesus? That, that's the way to eternal life? We think the same thing too, don't we? It's so easy to think that I've got to be this super religious person. And if I'm this super religious person, I can't ever screw up because once I screw up, then I got to start all over again. I got to earn my way all the way back to having that comfort of knowing that, that my reality is heaven. I got to earn that all back. It's so easy to believe that how I perform in life, what I do or I don't do, will determine my salvation will determine if heaven is my re reality. It's so easy to fall into that. And if that's what you think, if you think that your eternity is based on how you perform in this life, you're gonna be one of the most anxious people there are. Because what you've done is you've made yourself your own savior. You gotta save yourself now. You've made yourself the way. And the reason why we do that is because we can control that. If I'm the way, I can control that. 
If the way is someone or something else, I don't like that. I don't have any control over that. If you think you've got to check a bunch of boxes, if you have to live this perfect life, if you are your own way to eternal life, to salvation, to grace, then you are just asking for more stress, more anxiety, more depression, more fear, because you've got to save yourself now. That's not what Jesus is talking about. That's not the way. So then a very real honest question that we all need to ask ourselves is then, like Thomas, do you not know the way? Do you not know the way? Last month, uh, we were in Zion National Park in Utah, which is one of my favorite places on the planet. Love it. My favorite hike there is Angel's Landing. Anybody here done Angel's Landing? Yeah, there's a couple of people. All right, a couple of people done Angel's Landing. Beautiful hike, incredible. The view from the top of Angel's Landing is one of the most beautiful views on the entire planet. But this hike is also pretty dangerous in some spots. There, there's parts where the trail is, it's only a couple feet wide and, and it's a thousand feet straight down. Like you fall, it's game over. And there's been people that have, that have died on, on this hike. Now I've done this hike a, a few different times, but when we were there in October, I wanted to bring my two oldest kids with me because one, I thought they could handle it. And two, they really wanted to go. So they had never been on the hike before. They don't know the way. Even though the top is amazing, they have no idea what to expect on this hike. They, they don't know the way to the top. It's incredibly beautiful, but it's also dangerous. There's parts where you can literally wander off the trail without realizing it and walk off a cliff. So my kids, they, they don't know the way to the top. There are places where they can literally die so how do they make it to the top safely when they didn't know the way? Well, here's the thing. They didn't need to know the way. They didn't need to know the way to the top at all. They just needed to trust me and follow me. They didn't need to know the way. They just needed to know me. They needed to trust me. They needed to follow me. I was the way to the top for my kids. So when Thomas says, Jesus, I... I don't know the way. Jesus says, Thomas, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. When Jesus says, trust me, we can also trust in the substance of this statement. When he says, I'm the way, He's saying, I am the only way to eternal life. I am the only way to heaven. I am the only way to experience God's presence right now and to be in it for eternity. Jesus is the way. When he says, I am the truth, he's saying, I'm the one that fulfills all the teachings in scripture. I am the one true God. I am truth. If you want, Jesus, if you want truth, it's found in Jesus alone. When he says, I am the life, he's saying, I'm the one that fulfills all the promises to give you life to the full right now and for you to have eternal life for eternity. Man, this is a gift that Jesus is saying right now. It's a gift to us. It should bring great comfort to us because it's really hard to be troubled if you have the way. It's really hard to be troubled if you have the truth. It's really hard to be troubled right now, even though things are bad, if you have eternal life. So no matter what's going on with you right now, like what you've been through this year, what's happening right now, whatever's going on inside your head, take comfort in the fact that you don't have to wander and try to figure out what the way is anymore. It's Jesus. You don't have to stand on uneasy ground that lacks truth. You don't have to worry about a temporary life that could be gone at any moment. Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life that you are meant to have. You just gotta trust me. You just gotta trust me. And, and maybe the exclusivity of that statement is hard to swallow. Matt, you're saying that Jesus is the only way is that what you're saying? That, that he's the only way to eternal life? He's, he's got the corner on truth? Is, is that what you're saying? Because that seems way too exclusive. Is the exclusivity of Jesus and what he's saying, is that a barrier for you? Because a lot of people struggle with this. 
Because that means like, are we saying that all of the other claims for truth and to, a way to eternal life and, and that, they can, that they can provide a way, claims from other religions or other ideologies in the world. What Jesus is saying right here, the exclusiveness is, is saying that those claims aren't true. Is, is that what Jesus is saying? Yes. Yes, that's what he's saying. And I can say that with humble confidence, that he's it. There's no other way. And that also should be, be a great comfort to us. Here's why. Jesus is exclusively inclusive. He's exclusively inclusive. Here's what I mean by that. What Jesus is saying, what the entire Bible teaches is incredibly exclusive. It's incredibly exclusive, but it's entirely inclusive in that it's for everyone. It's for you, it's for me. Jesus offers it to everyone. We don't get to customize the truth. We don't get to, to form it to our own personal preferences. That's not what it is. Jesus says, no, 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 this is it right here. Here's the truth, here's the way, but I want it for you. That's a gift that we don't have to wonder, is it this way, is it that way, or can I mold it to this, can I make it this? No, 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 it's this. It's a gift that it's only one way. Let me break it down like this. If you ask me for directions on how to get to my house, Matt, how do you get to your house? And I said to you, you know what? Just go whatever way you want. Just go whatever way you want. Well, you're not gonna end up in my driveway and you're gonna look at me like I'm a jerk or I'm stupid. What do you mean go any way you want? If you just go any way you want, you're gonna end up in California or Colorado Springs or Canada, Kansas. I'm just kidding, Kansas people. We love you too, right? If I say just go any way you wanna go, you're not gonna end up in my driveway. You're gonna end up in who knows where. My driveway is on one specific street. I live on one street. And if I really care about you, I'm going to tell you what street that is. The exact same thing is true, true with Jesus. Even though I live on one street, man, there are an endless number of ways that you can get to my driveway. You can get to my street. You could go 66 or 119. You could go up and down I-25. You could take a bunch of different back roads that would get you to my street. The same thing is true with Jesus. He is one street. He is one way, but he will use all different kinds of roads to get you to that one way. The way that Jesus got a hold of me is different than the way he'll get a hold of you. The way he got a hold of me is different than my wife's or friends of ours or people in this church. Your way, how Jesus will get a hold of you and bring you to his street is completely different than everybody else's because you have a story that's different than everybody else's. Jesus uses all kinds of stories to bring, him to, to bring you to him. I mean, the Bible is littered with different stories, completely different kinds of people, all brought to Jesus. He will use your story to bring him to you, but he's the one way. That exclusivity should bring great comfort to us because he's offering it to everyone. And now we don't have to wonder what the truth is. Is it this? Is it this? Is it this? Who knows? No, it's this. Jesus, that's the truth. You don't have to wander around hoping that you end up in my driveway somewhere. Now, here's the way, here's the street. That's a gift. There was a, a 15th century author and theologian named Thomas Akempis, and he said this about uh, John 14, 6. He said, without the way, there is no going. Without the truth, there is no knowing. And without the life, there is no living. Because of the exclusivity of Jesus, you can now walk through this life knowing the truth and knowing that your life is full now and has eternal life to it also. That's a gift. So if you're struggling right now, remember that the reality of heaven should be a great comfort to us, especially in a year like this. Man, when things are down, let's focus on what's coming next. It should give great joy, great comfort, great peace. It doesn't mean there won't be stress or pain right now, but man, we've got something so much better coming. So much better coming. That means you don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have yourself put together all the time. You don't have to know how to navigate all the lows and the highs of this life. You don't have to know the way through crisis. Jesus is the way. You just need to know Jesus. You just need to know Jesus. So the question for you is, do you know Jesus? Do you know him? Jesus, thank you so much for exclusive truth. So we don't have to guess. We don't have to wander around aimlessly. We don't have to get unnecessarily hurt. 
There's so many lies out there that hurt. Thank you for being the way. Thank you for being truth. Thank you for giving us life when we don't deserve it, when we haven't earned it. But I pray that you would give us the confidence and the courage and the joy to continue to follow you, that we would seek after you, that we, our lives, everything about our lives would be focused on you because you're the way. We love you. We're thankful for that. It's in your precious name we pray.